Flowers are blooming in Antarctica. There are two species of flowering plants in the continent, the Antarctic hair grass and the Antarctic pearlwort, and they're both growing at a much faster rate than ever before. In a study published by the University of Serbia in Italy, it was discovered that between 2009 and 2019, the hair grass grew at the same rate as it had in the 50 years between 1960 and 2009. The entire continent has warmed by around 3 degrees Celsius, and glaciers have begun to melt. All around the world, people are experiencing extreme weather conditions like never before. Rising sea levels, heat waves, unpredictable weather patterns. The earth is warming faster than ever before, and it's because of human consumption of fossil fuels. On December 10th, 1985, Carl Sagan, one of the world's brightest astronomers and science communicators, gave a speech to the United States Congress. Everything you're about to watch was said 39 years ago, but it could have as well been said yesterday, since nothing has really changed. At the time the speech was given, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was 346 parts per million. Today, it's 421 parts per million. If we don't do something collectively, we will reach tipping points in the next 40 years that will endanger our planet's ecosystem. Carl Sagan offers a masterclass in explaining what climate change is, what could happen, and what we can do about it. Here is that speech. Uh, as I understand my, uh, my function, it is uh, to uh, give some sense of what the greenhouse effect is, to uh, try to say something about uh, greenhouse effect on, uh, on other planets, to uh, again underscore that this is, uh, is a real phenomenon, and then uh, perhaps I can take the liberty to say uh, a few remarks about uh, uh, what to do about it. The uh, power of uh, human beings to uh, affect and uh, control and change the environment is growing as our technology grows. And uh, at the present time, we clearly have reached the stage where we are capable, both uh, intentionally and inadvertently, to uh, make significant changes in the global climate and in the global ecosystem. And we've probably been doing, uh, on a smaller scale, things like that uh, for a very long period of time. Uh, for example, um, slash and burn agriculture, uh, which has been uh, with us for tens of thousands of years, probably. Uh, changes the climate to some extent uh, by changing the albedo, the reflectivity of the Earth. Uh, that uh, massive changes uh, have occurred is clear from the historical record. For example, Egypt was once the breadbasket of the uh, Roman Empire. Uh, it uh, may be the same uh, role as the American Midwest plays today. Uh, that is certainly no longer the case. It's not a greenhouse effect uh, issue. It, uh, uh, maybe an overgrazing issue, but is an example of how humans are perfectly capable of making uh, uh, these unexpected and inadvertent changes. Uh, because the effects occupy more than a human generation, there is a uh, tendency to uh, say that they uh, are not our problem. Uh, of course, then they are nobody's problem. Uh, not on my tour of duty, not on my term of office, it's something for the next century, let the next century worry about it. But the problem is that uh, there are effects, and the greenhouse effect is one of them, which have long time constants. If you don't worry about it now, it's too late later on. And so in this issue, as in so many other issues, uh, we are passing on extremely grave problems for our children uh, when the time to solve the problems, if they can be solved at all, is now. Let's stop here for a second. I want to take a moment to ask, have we done anything at all to try solving these problems in the over 35 years since Carl Sagan gave this powerful warning? Well, global awareness about climate change has definitely grown. We've seen international initiatives like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and agreements like the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement. These got countries to start working together on cutting carbon emissions, but while well, some progress has been made, we're still not acting quickly enough. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions hasn't progressed at the speed or scale needed to combat global warming effectively, and the transition to clean energy faces massive financial, logistical, and technological challenges. Addressing these issues before it's too late requires cutting-edge solutions, technologies capable of transforming the way we generate and use power. Fortunately, one publicly listed company called Hillcrest Energy Technologies is already leading the charge in this space. Hillcrest is developing initiative solutions to make energy conversion more efficient with a technology called the Zero Voltage Switching, or ZVS. Here's how it works. 
Solar panels generate direct current or DC electricity. But the homes, buildings, and power grids we use need alternating current or AC electricity. To convert that energy into something usable, an inverter is required. And Hillcrest uses its CVS technology in inverters to convert DC to AC with an incredible 99.7% efficiency. The high effectiveness drastically reduces the energy loss during conversion, which is a game changer for renewable energy systems. Their innovations could reduce the size of electric vehicle battery packs by up to 15%. Their grid tiered inverters for wind and solar farms could see revenue increases of 13.2 million for a 250 megawatt solar farm and 16.4 million for a wind farm over their lifespans. To learn more about their mission and groundbreaking products, click the link in the description. Yes, we do still have a long way to go, but Hillcrest Efficient Energy Conversion Technology is pushing the boundaries of what's possible right now, giving us hope for a more sustainable future. Solving a complicated issue like this requires us to fully understand it first, and as Carl Sagan is about to explain, perhaps the best way to understand what's happening to the Earth is to travel to other planets. If you ask what determines the Earth's climate, clearly the main, the main thing that determines it is uh, sunlight. Sunlight is what heats the Earth. Uh, not all the light that uh, arrives at the Earth from the sun goes to heating the Earth. Some of it is reflected back. It's just the, uh, the part that is absorbed. Uh, and what happens is there's a certain rate at which sunlight is absorbed by the Earth's surface, and there's a certain rate at which the Earth's surface radiates to space. What comes from the sun is in the ordinary visible part of the spectrum that our eyes are sensitive to. What the Earth radiates into space is in the infrared part of the spectrum, longer waves than red, that our eyes are not sensitive to, but it's as legitimate, <coughs> excuse me, a, a form of light as the kind that we're, that we're uh, used to. Now, if you calculate what the temperature of the Earth ought to be, from how much sunlight is being absorbed, uh, equaling how much infrared radiation would be radiated to space, you find that the Earth's temperature, by this simple calculation, is too low. It's about 30 centigrade degrees too low. And uh, why is it too low? It's too low because something was left out of the calculation. What was left out of the calculation? The greenhouse effect. The air between us is transparent, except in Los Angeles and places of that sort, uh, in the ordinary visible part of the spectrum. We can see each other. But if our eyes were sensitive at, say, 15 microns in the infrared, we could not see each other. The air would be black uh, between us, and that's because, in this case, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is very strongly absorbing uh, at 15 microns and other wavelengths in the infrared. Likewise, there are parts of the infrared spectrum where water vapor absorbs, where we could not see each other if, uh, if we were only as far apart as we are in this room. If you add these infrared absorbing gases to a planetary, uh, to a planet, then what happens is the sunlight comes in as before, but when the surface tries to radiate the space in the infrared, it is blocked, it is impeded by the absorbing gases. And so the surface temperature has to rise so that there is an equilibrium between what comes in and what goes out. So this is uh, the greenhouse effect. It is a misnomer for more reasons than one. It's a misnomer in particular because that's not how the florist greenhouse works, but that's a very minor point. Uh, there are other gases which absorb in the infrared, uh, all of, uh, many of which have been mentioned already, nitrous oxide, methane, the uh, halocarbons, and these are uh, products uh, partly of uh, um, agriculture, it's fertilizers, um, refrigeration, um, aerosol spray cans, and so on, all products of our technology. We don't generate much water into the atmosphere, but we certainly do generate a great deal of carbon dioxide through the burning of wood and uh, fossil fuels and apparently uh, benign uh, activity. Who could object to uh, humans burning oil and coal, gas, and wood? I'd like to stress that the greenhouse effect makes life on Earth possible. If there were not a greenhouse effect, the temperature would, as I say, be uh, 30 centigrade degrees or so colder, and that's well below the freezing point of water everywhere on the planet. Uh, the oceans would be solid after a while. Uh, a little greenhouse effect is a good thing, but there is a delicate balance of these invisible gases, and uh, uh, too much or too little greenhouse effect can mean too high or too low 
uh, a temperature. And here we are pouring enormous quantities of uh, CO2 and these other gases into the atmosphere every year with hardly any concern about its long-term and global consequences. Certainly not all aspects of uh, how increased CO2 and other gases into the atmosphere affect the climate are known. There are still many uncertainties, although the overall picture is, uh, I think, quite clear and uh, quite widely understood and accepted. But there are questions about uh, aerosols, about uh, clouds, you heat up the earth, how much uh, increase or decrease in cloudiness is there, how does that change the albedo or reflectivity of the earth. There's questions about the uh, um, ocean and uh, uh, its response time to an increase in CO2. There are feedback effects. Uh, and uh, therefore, it is certainly worthwhile to uh, spend some additional money on uh, further research on the subject. Uh, another point is that um, the significant temperature changes on the Earth between uh, uh, ice ages and out of ice ages, glacial and interglacial time periods, seems to be connected with quite small changes in uh, the amount of sunlight that reaches the Earth due to changes in uh, the Earth's orbital properties, and that is a um, suggestion that uh, the Earth's climate system may be uh, uh, very delicately dependent on the sorts of factors that we're talking about here, and that's why it makes sense to study past climatic change uh, on the Earth as an attempt to uh, obtain some calibration. Another source of calibration is uh, the other planets. Every planet with an atmosphere has some degree of a greenhouse effect. The most spectacular case by far is the greenhouse effect of Venus. It's the nearest planet, it's a planet about the same uh, mass, radius, density as the Earth, but uh, it uh, is spectacularly different in <laughs> several respects, one of which is that the surface temperature is about 470 degrees centigrade, 900 Fahrenheit, and that enormous temperature is not due to its being closer to the sun because Venus is surrounded with bright clouds and in fact uh, because it reflects so much light back to space if that's all that was happening it would be cooler not warmer than the earth. The reason for this uh, absurdly high temperature on the surface of Venus which is uh, well understood I mean Soviet spacecraft have landed on Venus and in effect stuck out a thermometer there's no doubt that that surface temperature is very high um, and, and later U.S. spacecraft have as well. Uh, the reason is a massive greenhouse effect in which carbon dioxide plays the major role. Now the amount of CO2 in the Venus atmosphere is uh, much larger than here. Uh, the atmosphere is almost entirely carbon dioxide and there's 90 times more of it uh, there than here. But it is an indication of uh, what can happen in an extreme case. You look at uh, Mars or Jupiter or Titan the big moon of Saturn, and you have additional examples of greenhouse effects. Different gases, different amounts of sunlight reaching the surface, different planetary albedos and cloudiness, uh, and in all those cases there is also a greenhouse effect. In addition, it has been possible to calculate those greenhouse effects fairly accurately, so that the kind of theoretical uh, uh, armamentarium which is used to calculate the greenhouse effect, greenhouse effect changes on the Earth, is also used for other planets and therefore can be calibrated to some extent against those other planets. If we keep coming out with the right answer in all those different cases, then probably we understand fairly well how greenhouse effects work. It would, however, uh, be worthwhile in along the lines that uh, Senator Gore was talking about to uh, have an increased program through NASA to understand the greenhouse effects on other planets, this might be a very uh, practical uh, application uh, of planetary exploration. As you've heard, the, uh, the best estimates, they certainly have some uncertainty attached to them, are that uh, at the present rate of burning of fossil fuels, the present rate of uh, increase of minor infrared absorbing gases in the Earth's atmosphere, that there will be a several centigrade degree temperature increase uh, on the Earth, global average, uh, by the middle uh, to the end of the next century, and that has a variety of consequences, including uh, uh, redistribution of local climates and uh, through the uh, uh, melting of uh, glaciers, 
uh, an increase in global sea level. There is concern uh, on a somewhat longer time scale about the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet and uh, a general rise of uh, many, many meters in, uh, in sea level. So uh, we, uh, we have a kind of handwriting on the wall. Uh, certainly there's more research to be done, but as I say, there is a consensus. What can be done about it? The idea that we should uh, immediately stop burning fossil fuel has uh, such severe economic consequences that no one, of course, will take it seriously. But there are many other things that can be done. Uh, one has to do with uh, subsidies for fossil fuels, more efficient use could be uh, encouraged by fewer government subsidies. Secondly, there are alternative energy sources, uh, some of which are uh, useful, uh, at least locally. Um, solar power is certainly one that might be of more general use. Safe fission power plants, which are uh, in principle possible. Uh, and then on a longer time scale, uh, the prospect of fusion uh, power. Fission and fusion power plants, uh, in principle, uh, vent no infrared active gases and therefore uh, whatever other problems they may provide, they do not provide a greenhouse problem. Uh, I'd like to close by just saying a few words on the, uh, the kind of perspective that this problem, as related problems, pose to us. Uh, here is a problem which uh, transcends our particular generation. It is an intergenerational problem. If we don't do the right thing now, there are very serious problems that our children and grandchildren will uh, have to face. Uh, it is also a global problem. It is no good if uh, just one or two major industrial nations take uh, major steps to prevent uh, a major increase uh, still further in CO2 and other greenhouse gases because other nations uh, may, uh, uh, through their industrial development, um, cause the problem by themselves. And not to say that this is inevitable, but just to give an example. Uh, the largest coal reserves uh, on the planet are uh, the United States, Soviet Union, and China. China is undergoing a uh, very major uh, industrial development. And uh, the burning of coal is certainly uh, something that must be very attractive uh, for the Chinese looking into uh, the future. Uh, I would say that there is no way to solve this problem, even if the United States and the Soviet Union uh, were to uh, come to a perfectly good accord on this issue without involving China and many other nations that will be uh, uh, developing rapidly in the time period we're talking about. So uh, here is a, uh, a sense in which the nations to deal with this problem uh, have to uh, make a change from their uh, traditional concern about themselves and not about the planet and the species. A change from uh, uh, the traditional short-term objectives to longer-term objectives. Uh, and we have to bear in mind that in problems like this, the initial stages of uh, global temperature increase, one region of the planet might benefit while another region of the planet uh, suffers. And there has to be a kind of uh, trading off of, uh, of benefits and, uh, and suffering. And that requires a degree of international amity which uh, certainly doesn't uh, exist today. I think that what is essential for this problem is a global consciousness a view that transcends our exclusive identifications with the generational and political groupings into which by accident we have been born. The solution to these problems requires a perspective that embraces the planet and the future because we are all in this greenhouse together. <laughs>